Welcome to the Hudson Institute. I'm Brian Clark, a senior fellow at the Institute and director of the Hudson Center for Defense Concepts and Technology. Uh, we're honored today to have with us the ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee, uh, Congressman Mike Rogers from the 3rd District of Alabama. Uh, in addition to being a longtime member of the House Armed Services Committee, uh, Congressman Rogers has also uh, have been a uh, ranking member of the Homeland Security Committee. So he's been working in national security for a long time and, uh, and is an expert in that area. So thank you very much, Congressman, for being here with us today. Glad to be with you. Thank you. So uh, to kind of start off, uh, the, the Biden administration just recently uh, released its uh, budget, sent it over to the Hill, uh, and along with it, they've released at least an unclassified summary of their national defense strategy, which uh, is uh, apparently still available in classified form within the department. Um, but you know, there's a a lot of lot to be uh, talked about with regard to the defense budget and and its implications, and also whether it meets up with the strategy. Um, how did you uh, how do you take the the strategy? Do you think that the administration's on the right track with the direction they're going with this focus on integrated deterrence and you know some of the divest to invest that we're seeing in the budget? Um, or, or do you think we should be going in a different direction with regard to defense strategy? Uh, and do you think the budget is uh, meeting up with that strategy, or does the budget also need to change? Yeah, it really doesn't matter what the defense strategy is if we don't have robust spending. spending. And, uh, you know, I understand it's the best to invest, uh, but I don't like the way they're going about it. The fact is that, that uh, we are in the, the early stages of a transformation of our military uh, modernization process that is going to be at least a decade long and very expensive endeavor. While at the same time, we're coming out of two decades of war uh, where we have worn out everything we've got. So, uh, and then we, but we still have threats that we have to deal with right now where we're starting to transform the military and modernize it to deal with the, the threats of the future, which are coming from China. And it's a completely different, different animal from what we've been facing in, in uh, CENTCOM and now what we see over in, in UCOM right now. So, uh, uh, the fact is, the, the budget just doesn't deal with that reality. Uh, it didn't last year. Congress had to, to uh, address that. But I always <clears throat> I make this point. I've been up here a long time. Presidents propose budgets. Congress writes budgets. So I, you know, I don't care if it's a Republican president or a Democrat president. <clears throat> when we get their budget, we say thank you. And we ignore it. And, and basically, that's what <laughs> we're going to do again this year. Uh, you know, we had the chair, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs as well as uh, the Secretary of Defense testify before us a couple of weeks ago on the president's budget. And they had to acknowledge, you know, that the 2.2% inflation that they factored into the budget proposal is grossly out of line with reality. You know, we're at 8.5% right now. And that they're going to have to come back and, and modify those numbers as, as the coming months go by. So, uh, no, the, 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 the proposal by the president uh, makes modest increases. We need significant increases. And so, you know, we've been talking about making sure that we get a, a, a budget uh, for the Defense Department that is at least 5% over inflation. And, uh, and again, inflation right now is 8.5%. It may go to 10. We don't know. The, the, the thing that I try to remind people is... Uh, you know, I was around during the Jimmy Carter administration and, and then the Reagan administration right after. This inflation doesn't go away fast. You know, so uh, and it's going to be painful as it goes away. So we've got to be thinking big when we thought, think about dealing with funding the Defense Department with factoring in inflation and reminding uh, everybody that we're having to do this transform transformative process. Uh, and pivot away from CENTCOM to, to, UCOM, to uh, Indo-PACOM. And, and it's just a whole different dynamic as to what we need to be funding to, to deal with, with Chinese threats. So uh, uh, it all comes back to robust funding and, and it's gonna be multiple, multiple year funding. I, I keep beating that horse, but some, you know it's gotta be done. We have to be continuously reminding people that it's not just a one year, a two year, a three year endeavor. This is going to be at least a decade of us consistently uh, making the investments that we have to make to get us to where we need to be. And that's the, the pacing threat from China. 
Yeah, you brought up uh, several uh, areas where defense spending needs to increase, which I thought was interesting. So uh, you're a longtime member of the readiness subcommittee. Um, obviously, that's a big focus uh, for the department, too. But uh, it seems like in the budget to pay for readiness, they're giving up existing force structure. They're they're retiring ships. They're retiring airplanes. They're uh, getting rid of some ground troop formations. Um, so they're going to you know, give up all that in order to whatever is left, try to maintain ready. And that inflation is going to kill that. I mean, inflation, that's exactly where you start seeing it is in maintenance and uh, operations costs. Um, so uh, you know, the, obviously the divest to invest approach you know, is something they're trying to do to modernize, but it seems like in a lot of ways they're divesting just to pay for keeping up the force today and not really making the investments for tomorrow. Is that what you're seeing? That's exactly, you hit the nail on the head. And, and by the way, we're not going to let them do those things you just described. <laughs> they proposed it. Uh, we are not going to let that happen. And, and uh, I've uh, spoken very clearly to the Secretary of the Air Force and, and uh, his two chiefs when they came in a couple of days ago and the Secretary of the Navy and his two chiefs when they came in uh, the same afternoon and reminded them that these things they're proposing, like, you know, um, decommissioning 24 ships while you're only buying eight or buying 74 uh, airplanes when you want to decommission 369. Right. That's not going to happen. Uh, the fact is, it's our responsibility as Congress to provide them with the, the, the resources they need to meet today's threats right. while we prepare for the future. Right. They're not mutually exclusive. And that's the thing that we have to keep reminding them is stop trying to make the threats fit the budget number that the president gave you. You worry about the threats and tell us how much it's going to cost and let us worry about it. And, you know, the president will get a budget when we send it to him. You know, right. he doesn't tell us what we're going to do. Right. Uh, I'm just frustrated that under by law, we have to wait for the president's budget before we can start marking up because truth is we ignore it. I don't know why we have to wait for it. Maybe that's one of the things we can change in the law. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a good but place. That's right. exactly right. I mean, this the the Defense Department seems to think they've got to make their threats or their capabilities yep. fit an arbitrary number that comes from the White House, and that's not what we're going to do. Right. You know, it um and it it bringing up that point about the threat. You know the. You know, Indo Pacific commander, so Admiral Davidson and now Admiral Aquilino after him, both said China is going to be a problem for Taiwan this decade. You know, it's not a 2030s problem, it's a 2020s problem. And uh, we need to prepare for that. The, the divest to invest approach, the, you know, kind of taking money out of today's force structure in the hopes that it'll give us something in the 2030s, that seems to be at odds with what their own commanders are saying in the field about the needs uh, for the near term. That's right. And um, and that is the pacing threat. And Aquilina is is, is correct. Uh, but we just have to keep telling them, you know, what we expect. And and again, you know, we're, we're going to be the one to drive this train. It's not going to be them saluting and saying yes sir to the commander in chief. And they come over here trying to put lipstick on that pig. <laughs> All right. Uh and so uh, what do you, th so China is uh, you know, watching events in Ukraine and we'll talk, we can talk a little about Ukraine here in a minute, but what do you think China's taking away from what they've seen thus far in Ukraine where, you know, we were unable to deter Russia. They attacked anyway. Russia's had some difficulties, but you see them still, you know, chewing up territory and eventually being able to control part of, you know, used, you, what used to be an independent country. What do you think China's taking away from all that? Uh, two things. One, is bad and what I think is good. Uh, the, the first is I think China has seen the passivity from this administration that that I was worried they would see. Right. You know, we uh, in the Congress tried, we had great intelligence about what Russia was going to do dating back to last fall. Right. We tried to get the president to be proactive and send lethal aid as a deterrent to Russian aggression. He had a philosophical difference and felt like that for us to do that would be provocative. And he was more worried about upsetting Putin than deterring him. And it was just a philosophical difference and he's the commander in chief, he won. So uh, I, I, I hate that, that China saw our president being passive and reactive 
rather than leading and being assertive and, and trying to deter aggression. That was that was that was not good. Uh, so I think they they probably find that appealing it, with their desire for aggression. Now the thing that I'm pleased about is the way the world has turned on Putin. Um, Putin doesn't care, by the way. I mean, he, he, he doesn't care who doesn't like him. China cares about their standing in the world. And the fact that the world, save China and India and a couple other countries, have just turned Putin into the next Adolf Hitler. He'll never be able to wash this off. And, and major companies, you know, around the globe have pulled out of Russia so that at their ex at great expense. And so they won't have anything to do with them. Uh, they have become an international pariah, or Putin has. That is a problem for China because they have global aspirations and they do care what the world thinks about them. So I think that is going to have a chilling effect on their naked aggression against Taiwan because they see how the world has reacted to this kind of uh, aggression by Putin. So I, I, I may be naive about that, but that's just my impression. And I think it's significant uh, because China does care. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. Um, this would be you know where the administration would come in and say, well, you know, this is an integrated deterrence in action, right? The the diplomatic repercussions, the information repercussions, the economic impacts, those are things countries care about. So, you know, we can deter by relying on those tools, you know, more so than the military tool. Um, but it seems like uh, you know China's got other ways to you know bring Taiwan back into the fold, uh, you know, other than just a, a strict invasion. Um, it seems like our military tools need to be there in order to deter those other types. If it's not a full in invasion, it might be a bombardment or it might be a blockade or there's lots of other ways they can do it. So do we still need to have that military presence there to enable you know, deterring these other forms of aggression that China might mount? Absolutely. Absolutely. But we're having the same problem yep. that with, with the administration. He is so worried about upsetting somebody uh, as opposed to leading. The fact is we can do a lot to make Taiwan uh, a much more difficult target for Chinese aggression if we would just lead. Yeah. And the fact is this is not one that we can just sit by and just let happen. I mean, we cannot let China take Taiwan right. for a host of reasons. We will wind up involved in that when it's, as opposed to doing what we're doing with, with, with Ukraine right now. We're basically we're fighting a proxy war. Yeah. We will be involved in the Taiwan conflict. So, uh, but it, I mean, it's the same people that are, uh, that are by same liberals that were running uh, the White House when Obama was there and Putin took Crimea with no consequences. These are the same people that are advising Biden right now and they're giving him bad advice. And, uh, it's regrettable, but it is what it is. And he's the commander in chief. And so Congress is just going to have to keep pushing him and, and trying to get public opinion uh, uh, on our side so that he basically has to do it. So, so um, do you think uh, you know, the U.S. needs to start thinking about you know, putting troops on Taiwan maybe or having regular rotations of uh, forces there? I think you know, we've done a few training missions. It's started to be more consistent. But is that one of the things we need to think about more, more U.S. presence on Taiwan? Absolutely. There is nothing more effective as a deterrent than U.S. troops. And it, I, don't, I don't know if you've been keeping up with it, but that's one of the things I've been pushing for in, in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, I started this over a year ago with uh, the Yukon commander talking about enhancing our presence along the uh, Eastern flank. And uh, so we uh, got him on in testimony in, uh, in uh, the hatch. We had uh, the Yukon commander as well as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs all agree uh, that we need to redistribute. You know, we've got about 100,000 troops in Europe right now. Redistribute a, a lot of our troops along the, the front, put permanent presence in uh, Romania on the Black Sea, in uh, Poland, right up against the Ukrainian border, and in uh, each of the three Baltic states. So that's one of the things we're gonna be doing because there is nothing that is gonna have more of a chilling effect on Russia's aggression into a NATO country than seeing American troops. You know, they don't like seeing NATO. They really don't want to see American troops. Uh, that has a chilling effect on them. And it's going to be the same way with China. There's there's no substitute. Uh, but we can just rotate them through Taiwan. It doesn't have to be a permanent base 
necessarily, but make sure we're always over there. And we need to make sure that, that the things that we do give Taiwan, we can never get the president to do it, is all stuff that's interoperable with us and is going to be necessary for a conflict with China, stuff, stuff that, they, that they need, not just some things that they want. Right, right. I mean, to a degree, uh, Taiwan wants things that are more like uh, you know other militaries rather than things that are designed for the kind of situation they find themselves in. Right. Um, the, so uh, going go to Ukraine and going to Europe, I think, I'm glad you brought that up. So, um, you know, the increased troop presence uh, along the eastern front of uh, NATO that's been started, you know, with additional battle groups being put there, uh, we're now reacting. You know, we're now doing some of the things you'd been arguing for for a while. Um, to kind of you know close the door after to some degree the, the horse is out of the barn. Um, do you think if we had done some of those things before the Ukraine conflict started, we might have been able to better deter Putin? Do you think that would have shown more resolve, or do you think this is something that um, you know is just going to help us in terms of protecting NATO from further aggression by Putin? Uh, definitely, we'll do the, the latter. Yeah, uh, but no, I really believe that we could have we could have made. Ukraine a much less attractive target if we had been more uh, serious about providing them the capabilities uh, before the invasion. Because again, I can't overstate this. We couldn't talk about it because it's classified, but we had great intelligence. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was spot on. I don't know how they got it, but <laughs> it was really incredible intelligence. And uh, we knew what they were going to do. I think we could have really made it less appealing if and uh, but now we have the, th the thing about uh, what we're talking about now with redistributing troops we uh, it was a luxury with ukraine it's a it's a necessity with nato countries because we're going to wind up pulled into that fight if he if he crosses one of those borders so i i think it's just imperative that we make sure those american troops are there to let him know to not even think about it you know, that we're taking this altogether differently than what we did with Ukraine, because Ukraine is not in NATO, unfortunately. Uh, but we need to make sure he understands to not even consider uh, uh, going into a NATO country. And you cannot do that any other way than American troops, in my view. But the capabilities their military has, we, we own a lot of that. And we should take pride in the fact that uh, they're able to push back as effectively as they do, because we've been making investments for eight years in that, in that military. Yeah, and and we that's haven't done that in Moldova. That's the reason why it came yeah. to my mind. You mentioned Moldova. We just hadn't been over there helping them. I don't know what their capabilities are. Right. That's a good point. They 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 don't have that same partnership program uh, as Ukraine did. Um, you know, when you think about Taiwan, we we do training events with Taiwan. You know, but we have not yet extended that same kind of you know kind of tight relationship where you had the California National Guard training Ukrainian troops year after year after year. We need to maybe think about doing that same kind of thing for Taiwan uh, exactly. to get them to that point. Um, you know, which, uh, which brings up a, a, a point I was going to uh, raise because we had talked a little bit about increasing costs for defense. Um, you know, people is you know, obviously one of our biggest expenses in the DOD, and it's one of the fastest growing ones. You know, with the tight economy uh, or with the tight labor market today, um, you know, we're hearing from all the services, they're having difficulty meeting their recruiting targets. Um, is this another area where we got to look at spending more money is, you know, making, you know, compensation higher for, you know, potential recruits to bring them in the military? Are we going to have to, to dramatically change how much we pay or how much we uh, compensate the, the folks trying to come into the, or that we're trying to get into the, to the DOD? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. That is a, a priority area for me. Uh, for this and the next two or three years, particularly when it comes to enlisted compensation. Uh, we are just not, we're not paying enough. Uh, and it's not just pay, it's benefits. You know, we've got, uh, the military of the future is going to be much more highly skilled, much more technologically advanced than, than what we currently have. Uh, I can't overstate you know, how important, you know, we, we just created the Space Force because space is now a warfighting domain. Cyber is a huge warfighting domain. Artificial intelligence is going to be a big part of the future. So we're, when, we when I talk about transforming the military to military of the future, modernizing, it's going to be much more highly skilled, highly technical military, which means we're going to have to much, have a, have a much more highly educated and skilled workforce. Well, you got to pay those folks to get them 
And they're going to be different animals than what we've been recruiting in the, in the past. So we're taking a good hard look at the entire package of compensation and benefits so that we can start trying to gear it toward uh, getting the people we need. And it's going to be expensive. I mean, that's the biggest part of the budget right now. And it's going to be expensive, but we really don't have a choice. Um, we're going to have to get those people in, and you got to, you got to compete. Uh, you got to make it attractive for the family. That's why I keep talking about the package. Uh, you need their spouse to want to commit to a career in the military. So that, that you're going to have to worry about you know, daycare, health insurance, employment opportunities for the family members when they're moved around, a whole host of things. Uh, and pay it at a minimum. We know for enlisted, it's just, it's not what it needs to be. And we're not going to be able to hit recruiting targets. Uh, it's going to be a much bigger gap between what we're getting and what we need uh, if we don't make that change. But I, I, I think this is going to be a bipartisan endeavor to get us to a better place so we can compete for that, that talent. Yeah, you know, another place that uh, we're competing for talent is in the industrial base. Um, you know, our shipyards, our weapons manufacturing, the arsenals, um, you know, they're all having difficulty bringing workers in um, who have other options, you know, to make, you know, similar money. Um, and maybe they don't get the same you know, benefits or the, the same, you know, cachet as being in a, a uniform member of the military. Um, you know, part of it, part of that is how much money you have to spend. So spending more will, you know, help us to to buy more, which obviously will help the industrial base. But are you, uh, is the committee looking at ways to try to target some more uh, spending to, you know, prop up or, or sustain parts of the industrial base that are, you know, kind of having a feast or famine experience right now because, uh, you know, they'll get an order uh, and then they they you know don't get a lot of orders for several months or a year and then they have to get another bunch of orders in. It's difficult to maintain a workforce in, in an environment like that where the budgets are so uneven. Uh, have you have, is the committee working on ways to address that? Well, the 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 pro and that's why I go back to what I said in the very first opening comments. We are going to have to have sustained increases in spending every year for several years. The shipyards are a perfect example. They can't just have one year or two years of funding. A, a huge capital investment has to be made for them to do the things that, that we need them to do. And they need steady streams of work that are coming to them. So uh, that's why I'm working on making sure that, that we talk consistently about giving them uh, steady budgets that are increasing and not going through these ups and downs that they just can't do. You know, our shipyards, we can't have fewer shipyards than we have right now. It's just, we need more, we need more capability. And, uh, and I'm determined to figure out a way to help get them some sustained, steady uh, work that they can count on and, and make the investments they need to get the workforce for us, us to be able to, because that's going to be a big part of our future spending is we pivot the Indo-PACOM and, and the China's threat, Chinese threats. The Navy has got to be more capable than it is now, a much larger fleet. And you're not going to get there by building eight ships and decommissioning 24. Right. That's for sure. Um, and uh, you know, also, you need a, a fleet with a more diverse fleet, I guess I'd say. So a lot more vessels, including smaller ones that you can keep out there all the time and that might be able to push back on gray zone uh, operations by the Chinese. Yeah, you, know, you can't exactly use a destroyer right. every time to do that. Yeah, and, and that's that's exactly right. Uh, but we gotta we gotta have the shipyard to build them, no matter whether you're talking about small or big vessels. Right. And and uh, I mean these folks are great Americans. I, I I love talking with them, but you know they got it's a business. <laughs> you got to be able to to uh, to to sustain your business, and that means you got to have steady work. You bet. And, and you know we had, we I we're at fault for making sure they haven't had that. It's, it's our responsibility to fix that. And, and we're, we're going to work on it. But, uh, one thing I, I do want to make sure your, your um, participants appreciate, and that is our committee is very bipartisan. It's probably the only committee left in Congress. Maybe the appropriators are a little bit bipartisan. We, we see this as, as uh, threats that are not Democrat threats, not Republican threats. Uh, and we work in a very bipartisan fashion uh, on the Hask, and, and uh, we will continue to do that no matter who's in the majority. Uh, we'll fight over transgender issues and Gitmo and nuclear weapon stuff, 
but those are literally 5% of the issues. The other 95%, we just we see them as threats and, and they're not partisan. So I do hope people appreciate the fact that, that we are bipartisan and that that's the reason why we get a NDA passed every year for 61 straight years. I mean, this is a big piece of legislation that authorizes almost 20% of discretionary spending, but we find a way to get it done every year. And so when I talk about these problems, like the, the uh, industrial base and the compensation for employees, uh, we're serious about it and we'll find some way to, to address these and we'll do it in a bipartisan fashion. These are not things that are just gonna be talked about and nothing done about. Right, absolutely. And um, you know, one last thing I wanna ask you about before we close is um, you know, you've been a long time member of the Homeland Security Committee. Um, obviously, we, with the fight in Ukraine, we were worried about cyber threats. We were worried about now the nuclear threat from Russia. Um, you know, are we doing enough to be able to deter those kinds of attacks from a, a, a threat uh, like Russia or even what we might see from China in the future? Um, do we need to? Where do we need to ramp up in terms of defending our cyber and uh, cyberspace and uh, nuclear weapons deterrence? Yeah, we don't do enough. I mean, obviously, the president's budget's talking about. You know, getting rid of the sea launch cruise missile and, and some of the B-83 gravity bombs, which we aren't going to do, by the way. But just talking about it is, is not helpful, yeah. <laughs> not helpful when you're trying to deter uh, aggression. Right. We have a lot of work to do on uh, uh, defensive capability on cyber. We've got some pretty impressive offensive capabilities. Uh, we need to do a lot more on the defense side. And I tell you, one of the interesting things that, that we're looking at doing in the HASC uh, you may be familiar with the Defense Innovation Commission that Eric Schmidt helped co-sponsor, a uh, co-chair. Last year, they gave us a recommendation to start a digital service academy. And we fully embraced that on a bipartisan basis uh, because the only way we're, and it's going to be something we try to do for the Defense Department, uh, not just the military, but the civil, civilian uh, personnel. Because if, if we're going to be able to deal with cyber and artificial intelligence, we're going to have to train our own. You know, there's not enough people in the private sector to deal with theirs. So uh, we're looking at standing up a, a digital service academy that will be focused on preparing our workforce to deal with the threats you're talking about. Uh, and in the meantime, while we're trying to set it up, looking at scholarships that we can fund for people to go to school and get those skills uh, because uh, we just don't have them right now. And those are very real threats that are gonna be very prominent in future conflicts. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're finding that that's where a lot of the fight's happening day to day. And so we're going to have to build our own, just like we have in every other area of the military. Um, absolutely. Well, uh, Congressman, uh, thank you very much for uh, taking some time out to talk with us today. Um, we appreciate you and the work you're doing. And we really you know, hope that the, the committee is able to pull together a, a, a pretty effective defense budget this year. Um, and we uh, wish you all the best. Thank you very much.